So let's talk about what we talked about when we were in week five. And if you remember, that was all about bones that form the scaffolding of the musculoskeletal system. So we had a bunch of different types of bones. We had flat bones like the shoulder blades and iliac crest. We had short bones like the, maybe the cuneiform bones of the foot and the carpals up here. We have irregular bones like the vertebrae. And we have sesamoid bones like the patella and then the actual named sesamoid bones which are underneath the ball of the foot. And then most importantly for us, because these are the, the primary load-bearing structures in the body, we had long bones, like all of these. So we spent a lot of time looking at long bones. One of the things that we learned was some vocabulary for describing the different parts of the long bones. So we have the epiphysis, which is essentially the most distal and proximal ends. We have the diaphysis, which is like the middle part. And then between those two, sandwiched between those two, we have the metaphysis, which is a term you see less often, but usually epiphysis up, up here and diaphysis in the middle. That's terminology you'll run into a good bit. We also saw this distinction between cortical and trabecular bone. So let me take a slice out of the femur here. We saw how there's in long bones, there's this kind of outer perimeter of cortical bone. And then in the middle, you've got trabecular bone. You have some bones of your body, like the, say, the iliac of the, the pelvis, that are almost entirely a trabecular bone, whereas some of the longer, stronger, load-bearing bones, like the tibia, like the femur, humerus, they have this layer of cortical bone. But both of them are important for bearing loads, as you saw in that article about a bone loss during spaceflight. We also talked about the cellular process that happens when you put some mechanical stress on your bone and then it needs to repair. So broadly, the the order of events there is number one, damage occurs, damage or exposure, or exposure to stress. And again, by stress here, I mean that mechanical force divided by cross-sectional area stress. Then the next thing that happen is we activate those osteoclasts, which eat away at the old damaged bone. That happens for two or three weeks. And then we have osteoblast activity, B for building new bones. And those osteoblasts come in, and they start laying themselves in, in the damaged area that's been eaten away by the osteoclasts, and they eventually mineralize, solidify, and turn into what we call osteocytes, which are the primary source of strength for, for bones. We also saw this uh, very famous and well-known law, Wolf's Law, which governs or describes how bone is laid down and resorbed. And broadly, Wolf's Law says bone is laid down where it's needed, meaning where the demands of your daily life require it, and it's removed where it's not needed. So on one end of the spectrum, you have uh, people on bed rest, people who are mobilized, people uh, in space who are not subject to any gravitational loading. They experience a lot of bone loss because of this law. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have highly physically active people who have lots of bone getting laid down in the areas that they're stressing. During week five, we also talked about interventions for building bone strength. And we learned a few important parameters, mostly that the important things in that determine how much you increase your bone strength for a given, say, exercise stimulus has to do with the number of loading cycles It also has to do with the maximum stress, meaning mechanical stress. So we could connect that with force. And also the rate, the, the stress rate, strain rate. Let's say rate of force application. And by this, we just mean, say you land from a jump, that's a very high rate of loading. 
compared to, say, doing a very slow squat. We learned that, based on some animal studies, it seems that about maybe 60 to 100 loading cycles or more is what's going to stimulate the, the maximum uh, response from your osteoclasts and blasts. So too few of these, and you won't really get much of a stimulus for bone remodeling. And too many, it's not like too many uh, means you get less remodeling, but it does you mean, you mean you do more damage, but only inducing the same amount of remodeling. We also saw that it is beneficial to vary the direction of loading that your body encounters. And by that, I just mean... Uh, something like plyometric training or playing volleyball or basketball where the loading from, say, the ground is going to be a little bit different every loading cycle, that seems to be a bit better than something like running where every single step is almost exactly the same. Because of the timing of the activation of osteoclasts and blasts, we also saw there's this interesting phenomenon where at maybe three to five weeks after the introduction of a new stimulus for bone strength, your body's mechanical, the, the mechanical strength of your bone is actually a little bit weaker. And that's a consequence of a lot of osteoclast activity, but without osteoblast activity yet to build new bone. Finally, we explored what the stress strain curve of bone looks like. And we learned about how bone is an anisotropic material, by which I just mean that it has different mechanical properties when it's loaded in different directions. So we saw one important thing about bone is that it does not have a toe region. So its stress strain curve just looks like this. So no toe regions, linear, and then a little bit of a plastic region, and then either breaks right away, or maybe you get some deformation or breaks. In any case, if you are out beyond this, the end of this linear region here, you are uh, in, a, in a bad spot in terms of the integrity of your bone. Like with other materials, the stress strain curve of bone is going to be different depending on the, the, is different, the intrinsic properties of the bone. So maybe this is a strong, fit, well-trained athlete, and somebody with osteoporosis, their bone stress strain curve might look like this, right? So Number one, lower ultimate strength. And number two, not as stiff. So slope steeper, slope more shallow. We also saw that maybe these curves might be for bone in compression. And we saw that bone in tension has a dramatically weaker stress strain curves. But that makes sense because most of the loading that bone experiences is compressive because it's handling the weight of your body being pulled down by gravity. One other thing we saw about bones, or one other important thing we learned, is that the all of this stuff that I've been talking about for the stimulus to induce bone remodeling, that has to do with the force experienced by the bone, which is not the same thing as just your body weight. So for example, when you do a squat with a barbell on your back, we saw that the loading that, say, your femur experiences is not the weight of your upper body plus the weight of the barbell. It's all of those forces plus the forces from the muscles of, say, your quads and your hamstrings and your glutes all pulling up like this because those also add to the compressive and bending forces experienced by the bone. Then at the end of week five, we had this little interlude where we learned about friction. And I'll just write out the formula because it's maybe the best way to review. We learned this in preparation for discussing cartilage, which I'll talk about in another video. And we just we learned that the force of friction ha is proportional to this coefficient of friction multiplied by something called the normal force. And where we're going to encounter this is inside of joints. And in the context of inside of a joint, the normal force is the same thing as the joint contact force, which, by the way, is also a function both of the weight above 
uh, the joint and also the force of all the muscles crossing the joint. So if we were interested in the joint contact force at the, the uh, hip joint here, it would be also all these muscle forces plus the weight of the barbell and the weight of your upper body. So we'll talk more about the function of, of friction in joints when we talk about cartilage, but broadly, these were the things that we learned about bone during week five.